years ago, I, I was trying to remember, I think it was about four years ago, uh, I, believe it or not, I preached a series at Christmas, right? That didn't shock anybody. Uh, but in this series, yeah, thank you, expression of faith. But uh, in that series, I preached about favoritism. That there was a favorite. And you could be the favorite. And so I want to touch on that today. I'm approaching it from a little bit of a different angle than four years ago. You, you may not remember that series anyway. And so it's a great opportunity for me because uh, the Lord captured me on one of the mornings when I was up in the Smoky Mountains and watching the, the sunrise. And it's hard to see the sunrise because there was so much smoky smoke, the fog yeah. was, uh, over the mountain. But it's so beautiful and I was enjoying it, enjoying the Lord. But this is what came to me. So I, I'm going to... Uh, share this with you today and, and I, I want you to capture it because if you capture it, it'll make a difference not just where you are, but also uh, where you're going. It'll make a difference. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about uh, my family, the Halls. Uh, the Halls have a godly heritage. Not every generation followed through with godly heritage. Uh, they were either uh, lovers of God or they were outlaws. It was just, you know, it just went that way. The halls were people of extreme. They were either all out for Jesus or all out for darkness. And so it made for some very interesting reunions. Uh, you know, so I'm just telling you the way it is. Halls were all out. They were people that were all out. And uh, that was great if they loved you because, man, they poured on If they didn't like you, whoo! That's not good, because it could be pretty strong that direction. Um, for example, my great, great, great grandfather was a pastor. My great, great grandfather was a pastor. My great grandfather, my grandfather was a pastor. So there was a, a number of pastors through the uh, through the halls. But kind of what was interesting when it came down to uh, my granddaddy, because. Of course, his daddy was a pastor. He became a pastor. But when he was a teenager, he was encouraged to get on out of the house and move on down the road. Now, at that time, our nation was in a pretty tough time uh, when it came to money. It was a tough time in our nation. And uh, people were doing what they needed to do to survive. And my granddaddy's daddy, actually, it came down to this. They felt like because he was a short guy, he was a little guy, they felt like that maybe he wasn't going to be able to pull his weight in the outcome in the long run. And so he encouraged him to go on and find someplace else to live, someplace else to work. And kind of what happened in that day, they would attach themselves to an owner of a farm or a land and they would serve underneath uh, the people that owned the land. And so that's what my grandfather did. And you know, not only did he have the benefit of a place to live and some food to eat, that he had a place to work, but at the same time he found a wife because the owner's uh, daughter, he ended up marrying her, that was my big mom. And so, you know, it worked out real good for me. Uh, but the deal is, is that there, every family has strengths and weaknesses. I don't know if you know that. Now you may think your family doesn't have any weaknesses. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, that was so funny. Uh, but every family has strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a little term out there called dysfunctional. Yeah. And, and let me say it, every family has some level of dysfunction. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, the halls are the same way. Now, I'm real close to the Shipley's. I married one of Pastor Don's daughters, so I'm very close to the Shipley's. I've been with Pastor Don and Mary since 1981, so they know me too well. <laughs> but I know them pretty well too. Yeah. Yeah. And they also have strengths and weaknesses as a family. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want to know those? <laughs> well, that's not in my sermon notes. <laughs> uh, so I won't. But the Halls have strengths and weaknesses. Now, a little bit different than the Shipley's. It's kind of interesting because really and truly, especially like Mother Mary and Gina here, they would like me to be more Shipley than Hall. <laughs> They're about at the place where they've given up trying to change me into a ship. Thank you very much. Halls can be extreme. They have a tendency to pick on people and laugh 
and carry on and pull jokes to the extreme. In the Hall family, if somebody started crying because of it, they considered it a victory. So they can be extreme. But I'll tell you what, they're extreme in love too. A little bit different than the Shipley's in this, because the Shipley's are a godly family, and I've been blessed by them. 1981, I've walked alongside them, married one of his daughters, stole her, I guess. <laughs> I don't think you gave her to me. If I remember right, we didn't give you blessing. But it was probably wisdom on your part, but it was God intervening that turned it into a blessing. But the deal is this, is that um, one thing about the halls, you go out to eat with them, which was a rare occasion. Because all the lights had to be turned off, all the water had to be turned off, so we could save a month worth of saving to go to Dairy Queen. That was our treat. And so if my dad, you know, Mr. Military, saw a light on, I right, we ain't going to Dairy Queen, that light's on. How much water's in that tub, boy? If it's more than a helmet full, it's too much water. Well, it's tight. But one of the things that was good about the Hall family, when you did go out to eat, they would fuss about who was going to get to pay for it. That's a little different than the Shipley's. When I first started hanging out with the Shipley's, I first thought that we were at an IRS convention. Because it came time for the bill, and the little lady had not divided it up, and man, all of a sudden, people pulling out calculators, and they're on their phone, and, 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 I, and I asked Pastor Don, I said, what is going on? He said, well, we're trying to figure out who owes what. And I said, well, why don't somebody just pay for it? He said, no, no. I, I said, that doesn't sound like love to me. Because it was different than the homes. I said, what, what, I don't know why y'all do that for. Why don't somebody just pay for it? He said, well, we are loving each other by not taking advantage of each other. There you go. Do you remember that, Pastor Gunn? Well, I thought that was just weird. <laughs> because when the halls went out to eat it didn't matter how many of them there would be a fuss about who was going to get to pay for it all and I'm that way too I paid for a number of their meals paid for the whole bunch but I want to tell you something I'll never forget one time the halls were out to eat of course they're country folk they in a city place and didn't know much about what was going on with the city place but they knew it was time to pay the bill and somebody grabbed the, the little uh folder there, and boy, there's a wrestling match going on, and people standing up and give me that, no, I'm paying, no, I'm paying for it, and come and find out it was a wine list <laughs> that they were fussing over. And so, I, I'm just telling you, every family has different emphasis. One of the weaknesses of the Hall family that I thought was just horrible was that the Halls, ever since my great-great-great-grandfather, you know, that's why my, my grandfather was told to hit the road, is that the Halls would pick out favorites. They practiced favoritism. Now, that doesn't sound too bad, but they had this little term, pick the litter. And it didn't matter if it was kitty cats or puppy dogs or if it was hogs or chickens. There'd be a pick of the litter. It didn't matter if it was kids, grandkids, yeah. great-grandkids, there was the pick of the litter. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that they didn't love everybody. They did. And, and anybody that grew up on Halls Hill, if you ask them, uh, did your bunch love you? Yeah. But if you were to ask them, well, who's the pick of the litter? Everybody would know all that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the pick of the litter. And just like people do with the little puppy dogs or kitty cats or something, they'd be in the pick of the litter. And, and they would take that one and they would pour out favoritism on that one. And, uh, you know, I don't like favoritism. And one of the reasons that I never liked favoritism is because I was never the favorite. <laughs> okay, now it doesn't matter. Great grandparents grandparents, or even my parents. I wasn't a favorite. In our little family, my brother was a favorite. Everybody tell you, everybody knew who, who was the pick of the litter. Well, my brother was a pick of the litter. And, and, and it came down to something like this, because 
When I was a young guy, I know the way I look now, you'd never know that I was under five pounds when I was born. But I, I, I wasn't even a good-sized bass when I was a young guy. And, and I was kind of uh, sickly. There was a little bit of a blood disorder thing, you know. And I was kind of sickly. And I, growing up, I was skinny. I was small. You, you can't imagine that. Okay, use your face. Use your gift of imagination. I, I was skinny. I was sickly and I was small. And uh, he was little teeny. That little teeny. And uh, even when I was growing up through elementary school and everything, I was still uh, small, kind of skinny, and sickly. As a matter of fact, I didn't start looking like a ball player until I found weights. And I had a coach that was big on weights. And he made sure that I stayed in the weight room because they believed in me. Now, it was something. I wasn't a favorite at home or on Halls Hill but I was a favorite on the ball field. I had coaches that even at seventh grade were speaking like prophecies on me. And man, I ate it up. I wasn't a favorite on Halls Hill, or in my, but I was a favorite there in the locker room. And so, man, I ate it up. And you know, that just encouraged me to be all the more. I'll never forget my dad, you know, because he'd have some of his buddies over and he loved football and talked football and his buddies came over. It's two different times in my life I remember this happening. One when I was a little bitty fellow, and one when I was in about fifth or sixth grade. But his buddies would come over, and they'd be all talking it up, and they'd say, well, where's your boys at, LJ? Show us some future ball players." And here'd come little Timmy coming through there. And they'd say, well, how old is he? Well, there's something wrong with him. Is he sick or something? And my dad said, well, you know, yeah. And then my brother came come along. He was four years younger than me. But even as a little fella, he looked like a little weightlifter, you know. <laughs> he'd come barreling through there. And he'd come walking up. And I remember my dad saying this. Now, this right here, that's going to be my ball player. You watch. And he had this little term. He'd say, you watch the words that I say. You watch what I say. This is going to be my ball player right here. Now, because of Wade's favor of God, coaches that believed in me, that's not the way it turned out. I was a football player, pretty successful at it. My brother wasn't. Now, I rushed to my brother's defense. He could hit a baseball and knock the cover off. He was a great catcher. He was a great baseball player. Real, real good baseball player. Didn't play up in the upper levels, but he could have. Uh, but I want to tell you, uh, I couldn't hit a ball with a boat paddle, a baseball. I couldn't. Uh, but, you know, give me a helmet, and I, I, excuse me, this was before I learned how to walk with the Lord, but I, I, I enjoyed hurting people, <laughs> hitting people. And, and if you could, if you love to hit people, you're going to play somewhere at football. Yeah. It just was made for me. And so it worked out pretty good for me. But I want to tell you something. I didn't like favoritism because I was never the favorite. Yeah. I don't know if you ever experienced when you were a kid and they were picking teams or something and mm -hmm. you know picking people and then it was did you ever find yourself being the last one to be picked? Yeah. Well, I want to tell you. See, favoritism can work against you. Yeah. Yeah. Now. I want to give you some good news, and then I'm going to show you what the Lord showed me. Uh, people didn't pick me, but the Lord did. Amen. And I want to tell you real quick how it goes. There's a little saying in Scripture that confuses people because it says, many are called, but few are chosen. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to say it real simple because this is the way the Lord talks to me. I believe many are called, I believe He calls them all. Yeah. Yeah. I believe he paid the price for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I believe every little baby born, right. even before they're born, he's got a purpose and a design. Yeah. 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 I believe he has that. I want to tell you, yeah. when you receive Christ, I believe that book is open. Mm -hmm. And it begins to be even more fulfilled than what it has been. Yeah. And the fulfillment before that time is to get you to that place. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you, many are called the few are chosen. I want to tell you the ones that are chosen 
I believe everybody's called. I believe the ones that are chosen are the ones that say yes to it. Amen. You say yes, I'm telling you it's on. Yeah. I want to tell you, the way to fulfill your calling is to continue to say yes. Yeah. Amen. Because I want to tell you, me and you probably, all of us know people that started off at a good start, but somewhere along the line, they got turned around like a termite in a yo-yo and they began to say no, or they got confused. Or they begin to say yes to self and no to Jesus. And I want to tell you, your life can become a mess in a hurry that yes, way. Yes. And so, it's never over. I'm telling you, it's not too late. I tell people all the time, all you got to do is start saying yes now. Amen. And watch how the kingdom of God will begin to manifest in your life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay? I used to think that among the twelve disciples, that John was the Lord's favorite disciple. Now, I didn't know this until I started reading the Bible. Now, after I fell in love with the Lord, and I found out that the Lord loved me with an unfailing love, then I began to read the Bible. And so, I'm reading the Bible, and I noticed in John that it looked like John was the Lord's favorite disciple, the one that was closest to him. Yeah. And the Bible has a term that calls John the disciple whom Jesus loved. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, i got to ask this question. Does the Lord love everybody? Yes. Do you think he loved all the disciples? Yes. Do you think he loved Judas? Yes. Thank you for saying that. And so, but I was under the impression that John had some kind of special favor with Jesus. And because of my past, it really made, made me want to know what made him a favorite. What made him special that stood apart from the disciples? Well, it wasn't until a number of years ago, before I did that Christmas series, that uh, one morning the Lord just told me, let's read through John. Now, I don't know how you decide that. Some of you have Bible plans. That's great, too. And uh, sometimes the Lord points me in a certain scripture. Uh, sometimes he just tells me, let's read. <laughs> and so on that particular morning, I was just reading John. Now, I want to read to you five different scriptures out of John. John 21, 20 says this, But Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. Yeah. John 13, 23, it said this, One of his disciples whom Jesus loved, whom he esteemed and delighted in. Anybody see that? Yeah. You're supposed to have the scriptures in your notes. Somebody say amen. Okay. Yeah. John 19, 26, So Jesus seeing his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing near. Wow, there's another time. Yeah. What about this one? John 20, verse 2. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus tenderly loved. Whoa, there's another one. Here's another one, John 21, 7. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. Now, let me ask a question here. Do you want to be known as the disciple whom Jesus loves? I do. Okay, I want to tell you something. It dawned on me when I was reading through John that day because those seemed to just jump out at me. It dawned on me when I was reading through John the secret of John's favor. I saw it. The Lord opened up my eyes to it. I saw it. I got excited. And it goes something like this. The disciple whom Jesus loved, which I just read to you five different scriptures that say that. The phrase is not being used in any other gospel but John. So, it just hit me. I said, I'm going to see what Matthew says about this. He doesn't. <laughs> what does Mark say about it? Nothing. Now, it is interesting that Mark does refer to himself in a similar way like that in a uh, not personal term, not naming his name. And... Uh, it had to do in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's probably Mark 14, probably around 50, um, after the disciples had scattered. When they came to arrest Jesus, the disciples scattered. And here's little Mark. Now, Mark was a little fella at that time. Okay, he was a young man. He was just a lad. But he would get to hang out with the big guys because he wanted to be around Jesus. And I'm sure his mama probably said, well, if you're going to hang out with Jesus and the disciples, it's all right. And so he was. And so he was there that night at Gethsemane. And uh, when the uh, soldiers came to take Jesus away and all the disciples took off running, he, he stood around. 
And he was kind of following along. And one of the soldiers apparently reached out to grab him, and he was already in his jammies. When they grabbed him and grabbed his jammies, the jammies came off and little Mark took off running. That's right, he was the first streaker for Jesus. <laughs> Maybe the last one, okay? I'm not promoting that. But I'm just telling you, a little fella, he took off uh, naked running home. So don't you know he had a story to tell when he showed up? Where are your jammies, boy? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, he had a reference to himself without naming himself in that same way. John doesn't ever say his name here, but I want to tell you what John 21, 24 says. It is this same disciple, same one being referred to, same disciple who is bearing witness to these things. I'm the one writing this, and I've recorded them, and we well know that his testimony is true. And so he's speaking of himself in that way. And it dawned on me that you know what? Uh, hey, it's only in the book of John. Right. Right. And so he's using this phrase to describe himself. Yeah. And this is what John was doing. This is the revelation that hit me. He was believing it and receiving it. Yeah. You see, Jesus loved them all. Yeah. He loved them all with the Father's love. We know that from later in the New Testament. He loved everybody with the Father's love. And so he loved people the same way Father loved him with the same quantity, quality of love. Yeah. That's why I can say to you today that you're loved by the Father and you're loved by the Son and Jesus loves you with the same love that Father loved him with. I'm saying it to you like this because we can put this out there. He loves you. Father loves you just as much as he loves Jesus. Is that a little stretchy for you? Does that push you a little bit? That's okay. Hang on. Alright? But this is what John was doing it. He loved everybody, but John believed it. Yeah, amen. To a greater measure. You see, sometimes people talk about faith and they say, well, you know, well, hey, man, we've seen Nikki's testimony. She's got a lot of faith. Amen. He didn't give me that much faith. No, he didn't. Because I want to tell you, he's given us all a measure of faith. Amen. Now, it's not who's got greater faith. Here's, here's the question. Who's appropriating it more? Yeah, <laughs> who's taking it? Who's grabbing it? Who's making it theirs? Because I want to tell you, he loves everybody in this room the same way he loved Jesus. He loves you just as much as he loved the Apostle Paul. He loved you just as much as he loved John. Here's the question. How much of it are you receiving? Yeah. I want to tell you how much you're receiving is how much you're believing. Yeah. Because I want to tell you, this was the secret. This is what hit me. And it's so simple. You say, well, why didn't you catch that years ago? I don't know. But I love it. Amen. He was practicing and personalizing the love that Jesus had for him. Listen to what John says later in one of the, in one of the little Johns. 1 John 4.10 and this is His love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us. You see, He's telling us the secret here is that, you know, because a lot of church life, you'll hear in teaching and presenting and sometimes it's presumed that, you know, you need to love God more, love God more, love God more. And these are rules and regulations that show that you love God more. No, no, no. John's telling us. Here's the secret of loving God is recognizing and personalizing how much He loves you. Amen. And when you recognize and receive how much He loves you, then you're going to respond by loving Him more. Amen. Because it's His love. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so He was believing and receiving. But that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And so... Uh, the very one that received his love recognized others that received his love. Listen to this, John 11, 5. Now, Jesus loved Martha. Now, I want to tell you, he loved everybody. But I want to tell you something. Martha was great at receiving the love of the Lord. Mary was great at receiving the love of the Lord. Listen to me. Lazarus was great at receiving, personalizing the love of Jesus. Ready? Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. 
They were his dear friends, and he held them in loving esteem. And so that is what's beautiful. Please understand this. We're all Father's favorites. But John knew the secret of accessing Jesus' unmerited favor for himself. Now, this is what you need to take and let the Holy Spirit make personal to you today. It is your privilege, it's your prerogative to see yourself as the disciple whom Jesus loves. Amen. And to call yourself that. Amen. Amen. You know, we describe it like this, practicing the three R's. You recognize it. Recognize it, that He loves you. The Bible says so. You receive it. You personally receive it. And you know what? Well, I want us to do that today. I, I want you to get still in your heart and you ask the Lord to show you how much He loves you in a personal way. Would you just do that right now? We recognize that this is true. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. But I want to tell you something. He wants you to hear Him say this personally with your name on it. Lord Jesus, we ask You, Holy Spirit, to come and to personalize your love in every heart, every life that's here. Mm -hmm. I speak in Jesus' name for ears of the heart, eyes of the heart to be open. To see Lord Jesus, His risen love for us, His personal presence to us. Lord Jesus, thank You that Holy Spirit can confirm Your love in a personal way. We recognize it. We practice personally receiving it. And you know what? We respond to it. I want to tell you how to respond to it. It's the three R's. You love them back. And so would you do that right now? Would you just tell the Lord, Lord, thank you for loving me. I know you love me. I receive your love. I love you back. Would you just tell the Lord back that you love me? Thank Him for loving. Tell Him how much you love Him. That's not hard to do. It's very powerful to do. Because I want to tell you one of the most important things that the Lord wants is for you to be still and let Him love on you. Amen. I was with grandkids uh, for a couple of days this week. And yes, I did get to hold little Colt, the newborn, uh, grandson, uh, grandkid number 12, grandson uh, number 4. Uh, but I want to tell you something. I was drawing fire because there was three grand girls all around me so the beautiful blonde could hold the little one. And so I was drawing fire. I was having a blast. Uh, but this is the deal right here is that, you know what, it's important to personalize that love. And... Let the Lord do that to you. One of the most important things for me as a granddad is to, for them kids to get still enough, long enough to let me just hug them. <laughs> well, I want to tell you, the Lord loves that. And He wants to be that with you. Would you allow the Lord to personally love on you? Because He wants to. When I started to teach the secret of John's favor, that He... The secret was, it laid in the personalization of God's love. And I want to tell you, when people begin to catch this, I know some of you may remember this a few years ago, but I want to tell you, when the saints literally stepped into a new dimension of experiencing God's unmerited favor in their lives, when they begin to focus on how much God loves them. You say, well, it sounds like children's church. Well, maybe we ought to be more childlike, not childish in our faith and in personally receiving it. How long has it been since you've experientially known the love of Jesus in you? Well, that's been too long. It's okay. It's your birthright to take a promise or a principle out of God's Word and own it. That's part of what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. He wants to put your name on it and to show you that Jesus paid for this for you. It is your birthright to practice walking in the love of Jesus. To personalize that love. Put your name on it. 
The old timers used to say it like this, demon so. That's a term they used a century or two back. Uh, the men of faith would say, deem it so, or reckon it so, is the way they would say it. Which means to make it you. Let it be personal, make it you. Now, I'm going to say this, uh, because I was at a place not too long ago, and uh, there was an emphasis on, well, we just need to be disciples for Jesus. And I'm all about being a disciple of Jesus. You know, a disciple means a follower of Jesus. Uh, but I want to tell you something. There's more to it than that. There's a greater level than being a disciple. And it goes like this. The greater level of being a disciple is being a son and daughter. He, he wants you to be a son and daughter. He wants you to know Him in that way. I want to tell you, a disciple has privilege. But a son and daughter has greater privilege. And He wants you to walk in that. That's why He paid for it. For us to be known as sons and daughters of the living God. And so that's what he's got in mind for us. That Jesus had thousands of followers. Of course, there were like thousands of them that just wanted to, you know, first cafeteria. You know, feed me, feed me. Do a miracle for us. But he had thousands of followers. He probably had hundreds of disciples. People that if you were to ask them, uh, you know, what rabbi do you follow? They'd say, well, I'm a disciple of the rabbi of Jesus. I, I follow what he says, I say what he says. And uh, so they probably had hundreds of disciples. But we know that there was a twelve. Yeah. Yes. Now listen, inside the twelve, there was an inner circle. Yeah. Peter, James, and John. Yeah. And so thousands, hundreds, twelve, inner circle, Peter, James, and John. But even inside the inner circle, there was John. I want to tell you, and, and, and it may hurt your feelings when I say this. It don't hurt my feelings if it hurts your feelings because I'm trying to help you. But it goes like this. We're just as close to Him as you want there you go. to be. There you go. Let me say it like this because this probably hits more of the middle of the road on it. You're just as close to Jesus as you're willing to be. There you go. Because He has said yes. He wants you to say yes wholeheartedly, not holding anything back. This revelation of being loved by the beloved. You see, we are loved because of the beloved. And so because of the beloved, which is Jesus, we are beloved. And that's our birthright because we're a joint heir with Him. He has adopted us into His family. Now part of the problem, I mean adoption is a beautiful picture. But part of the problem I see in the body of Christ with the adoption mindset is that there's too many of us that consider ourselves orphans. That we're not a favorite. No, no, no. That's the wrong mindset. I want you to see yourself as you truly are, that you are completely and totally loved by Jesus. Not less or more than any. I'm telling you, He loves you. And that you are a favored, highly favored one of Jesus. And I can honestly say you're one of His favorites. But the question is, do you know it? Do you recognize it? Do you receive it? Are you responding to it by faith? Are you saying it? Are you walking it out? Because I want to tell you, it turns your Christian walk into an adventure Amen. when you know that you're loved. Amen. And so, the people that I've shared this with, they keep reminding themselves that they are a disciple or a son and daughter who Jesus loves. I want to tell you what happens. They grow in a consciousness of the Lord's love for them. They begin to recognize it more and more. And at the same time, their confidence in being favor conscious is so evident. Because you know what happens to people that catch this? There are testimonies that come out of them about being so blessed just by believing their beloved, by the beloved, that they're well loved, they're conscious of Jesus' favor in their lives. Guess what happens next? You hear promotion. Yeah. Promotion comes. Man, we saw it happen. People popping up, giving testimonies. And I, I got a promotion here. And I, I got favor here. I got a raise here. Mm -hmm. The Lord's blessed me in this way and in that way. Uh, favor with God and man showed up. Personal ways, practical ways, uh, public ways. And, and I'm going to just tell you this. Here, here's the truth. You see what you focus on. Amen. 
And when you focus on the love of Jesus and that you are favored by Him, do you know what you see? When you see it on the inside, it is manifest on the outside. As a matter of fact, when you walk in the mindset of that you're loved by God and you're favored by God, I want to tell you, you attract the manifestation of that. Yes. Now that, that's a spiritual truth. It's also true to the other side. How many of you know, if you walk in worry, come on now, yeah. if yeah. you paint worry on your heart, then guess what happens? That, that focus begins to be manifest that's on the inside begins to happen on the outside. How many times do you worry about something or you're afraid of something and all of a sudden you see a fear manifested on the outside that was on the inside? That's the way it works. I want to tell you, worry will produce fear. Love will produce hope. Hope produces faith. That's Bible. Do you see that? That's the way of God. That's the way He loves to operate. And that's available for us. So you see what you uh, focus on. Yeah. Now, let me run it a little further. You become what you focus on. Yeah. If you focus on the love of Jesus, and you're walking in it, right. and you'll recognize it. I'll never forget, I was uh, one of the first I knew to buy a little Honda Accord. This was back in the 70s. And the little Honda Accord was out. And uh, I was traveling a lot. And I had these junkers, man. And I'm telling you, I had these junkers. I mean, it's the type of junker that every, you pray before you cranked. And then you thank God every time you cranked. And I'm trying to travel all over and preach. And so, you know, it really hit me that, you know, I need a car to travel in. And so I went down and there's this little Honda Accord there. And I'm thinking, I've always had big cars. I don't know if I want a little car. And man, they talked to me about it. And had me driving around. You know what they'll do. I'll take it. You know, drive it. See yourself in it. You know, they want to get you on the inside of the thing. Because they know. Man, you see yourself in there, you know. That's going to crank up a desire. That's the way the Lord works. That's why we need to be in the Word. See Jesus in the Word. And I want to tell you, it grabs your heart. The desires of your heart become manifest. You're drawn to that. Well, the next thing I know, I'm headed home in a Honda Accord. I'm just a teenager, but I bought my first car. And I'm headed home, and, I, and I'm thinking on the way, oh, I'm doing it in this little car, man. I, you know, the man, the longer I drove that thing, I hit the fifth gear, and I said, oh, yeah. This thing got five years, but I like that. And man, it did. I traveled all over the South, all over the United States in the South, preaching, and put over a quarter million miles on that little car. But I want to tell you something. I never even noticed a Honda Accord until I bought one. Right. That's right. That's right. They weren't out. They weren't popular. But the next thing you know, I'm seeing a Honda Accord everywhere I go. <laughs> and I never even noticed them before. You know why I was all of a sudden seeing Honda Accords everywhere? Because I was focused on them. You see what you focus on. Now this ought to say something if you got the money grubs yeah. and you got the negative mindset. If you're focused on giants, what are you going to see if you're focused on giants? You're going to see yourself as a grasshopper. Yeah. That's Bible. And so I'm going to tell you it makes a difference. When like David, you focused on a big guy. When you focused on a big guy, you're going to see yourself as God sees you. A man of God. No matter what size you are. No matter how old you are. No matter if the king's armor fits or not. No matter if you have a sword, the Lord tells you you're going to cut his head off. That means you're going to cut his head off. And you don't even have a sword. You just got a slingshot. Yeah. The Lord brings it to pass. Is anybody listening? Yes. Okay. Then I, I'm just telling you. I know the world has this term, lucky. But I want to tell you something. You see what you're expecting. You see what you're looking for. When the Lord, when you receive the love of the Lord, He paints hope in your heart. Mm -hmm. It's love. He paints hope. Hope begets faith. Right. Faith comes from hope. Yes. And I want to tell you, it's, it's a beautiful springboard how it takes place. But a positive hope is the positive expectation of God's goodness. When you're convinced in your heart that God loves you, you can hope for God's goodness to manifest in your life. Right. And you'll see it. 
And the world may call it lucky. They may call you lucky. That's not even a legal term as a believer. It's not even a real deal. There's no such thing as luck for the believer. You know what it is? It's the unmerited favor of Jesus. It means God loves you. It's the grace of Jesus. You know what that means? God loves you. So our part is to meditate on the goodness of God. It's to practice, see, recognize, receive, respond, the love of Jesus, the loving kindness that you're so loved. You remember, you believe. You believe, you receive. His hope comes. Expectation of God's goodness in your future. Now when you worry, you have an expectation of evil in your future. Hello. And so that's why that's so important. Now, when I was a little fella, the first picture I ever got of this wasn't in church. I was just a little fella, and I'd be at the house, and Sunday morning, we just where we lived, there was only one channel. We knew that football was going to come on that TV sometime on Sunday. And so Sunday morning, we'd crank up that TV early just to warm it up for football. But I'm telling you, I'd be in there on Sunday morning because it's just one channel, one TV. And so I'm sitting in there watching it. And there was this guy on TV on Sunday mornings, and he'd stick his finger out. But I think, you know, he's going to touch me in the nose. I mean, with that camera, it looked like he's going to touch me. And he'd stick his finger out, and he'd say this, Something good is going to happen to you. Man. I didn't know what that meant, but I liked it. And so every Sunday morning, I'd be the only one in there warming up that TV for football. And I wanted to see that guy say it to me every week. Something good is going to happen to you. And I want to tell you, I didn't understand it all, but it was birthing some seed in me. And I knew he represented God. And so I was saying, God is going to do something good to me. Well, I went and told my folk that. And I ain't going to tell you what they said. But I'm going to tell you, it, it was speaking to me. Listen to this. Isaiah 43, verse 4 says this. Because you are precious in my sight. Now, I want to tell you, this is Old Testament. This is New Testament language. See this. Hear this deep down in your heart. Because of the cross, I want to tell you, even before the cross, even before you were born, even before He came, He loved you. God so loved the world. That he gave. Before you were ever born. He came. He loved you ahead of time. Because you are precious in my sight. And honored. And because I love you. I will give. Now this verse says. Men in return for you. And people in exchange for your life. You say well what, what, what does that mean? It means that he so loves you. He so cares for you. He so honors you with his love. That he will cause, he will cause, he will cause, he will, he will, he will cause you to be the head, not the tail. The first, not the last. Above, not beneath. Favor. It's the favor of God. And you know what? He says, I will. Now that's New Testament language. Old covenant goes like this. You must, you must, you must. And there's churches all over preaching today. You better, you better, you must, you must. In order for God to like you, in order for God to love you, in order for God to do something for you, you must, you must, you must. I want to tell you something. That's wrong. Jesus paid the price. It was by His works, not by our works. That's what new covenant is. That's what grace is. So that was old covenant. New covenant is this. Jesus says, I will, I will, I will. He'll do it. He'll do it. That's love. That's favor. Hey, when it says, I will give, it means He'll move heaven and earth for you. His love attracts. I want to tell you a secret. Law repels. Love imparts the identity in Christ to us. It gives strength to abstain. Love does. Law won't. Law will not prevent you from sin. As a matter of fact, according to the New Testament, law will stir up sin in you. Is that like adding wood to a fire? The law is to show you how much you need the mercy and grace of God. It's to draw you to God. But I want to tell you, when you come to Jesus, His love is so powerful that His the love of His the power of His love will stop sin in your life. That's love. That's called transformation. Only Jesus, the cross, can give you a new identity as a new creation in Christ. You catch the revelation of Jesus. 
and just how precious you are in His sight today. And your life will be supernaturally transformed. Some today, but continually as you walk in. His love is received, not achieved. Not achieved, it's received. Just let Him love on you. I want to tell you, when you practice letting the Lord love on you, it will stop the traffic up here. And those of you that have traffic know what I'm talking about. It'll arrest it. You'll stop striving to fit in. There are people that go their whole life, I don't know where I fit, I don't know where I belong. Well, I'm going to tell you, His love will cause you to be at peace about that. Amen. Will give you a place of belonging. His love does. Sometimes we have, uh, you, you see little ones and you see big ones have this unnatural desire for attention. Well, they just crave attention. They're willing to be wrong in order to get attention. But I want to tell you, when you let the Lord love on you, you'll see yourself differently. Because this is what happens. Please catch this. You are of great value because God values you. Everybody else may be saying all kind of junk about you, but I'm telling you, God values you. His love and His acceptance will give you a supernatural self-control. His love will motivate you. Law won't. His love will. Love activates the fruit of the Spirit. Because I want to tell you, according to the Bible, the whole kingdom of God operates on His love. If it's not baptized, full of, flowing in His love, it don't even count. And it sure won't work. Yeah. Amen, Brother Tim. Okay. I want to tell you what happens when you let the Lord love on you. It's not by your willpower. Because His desire in you is greater than your willpower. You will respect and value others because He first valued you. And so, when judgment, condemnation comes, worry comes, negative expectation of bad in your future promotes all kind of fear, and I want to tell you, when you walk in that, it's a mess. Yeah. But I want to tell you what forgiveness does. When you walk in the forgiveness of the Lord, and you recognize and receive and respond about how much the Lord loves you, hope is birthed in your heart. Yeah. It may look impossible on the outside, but it's on the inside first. That's the way He likes to work it. And that hope will promote faith. And that desire to participate in destructive activities will dissipate yeah. in the flow of love. It will dissipate. The favor of God on you will cause you to not want to do those things. Yeah. I, I've worked with uh, sexual addicts and there's there's probably no stronger addiction than sexual addiction. Yeah. But I want to tell you, it's so exciting to hear their testimony when they begin to grasp how much God loves them. And even in the midst of their tug of war, when they confess that I'm loved by Jesus, I'm loved by the Father, I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. When they begin to say that, and they're in the middle of messing up, it's amazing how soon and very soon there's breakthrough that comes. You can't explain that. It doesn't add up with man talk. But it's supernatural and it's transformation. That's something God does. They're replaced. Those wrong desires are replaced with God desires for you. That's the power of grace. It's unmerited favor, unconditional acceptance uh, of you through the cross. God's able to do it. God's able to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. It's the Jesus factor. Amen. Amen. We describe it like this with grace because it's first His passion. It's His love for you. You let the Lord love on you. You discover His passion. And the next thing you know, you're enjoying His presence. And His presence becomes more real to you than you've ever known. More personal to you than you've ever known. And so it's His passion, His presence, and then it's His power. It's His power to do what you can't do. Something maybe you've tried to do, an addiction you've tried to break all your life, a situation that you've been locked up in, a, 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 a rut, a routine, a pit. And I want to tell you, by practicing letting the Lord love on you, that passion, enjoying His presence, His power is manifested, and there's breakthrough. And breakthrough comes. I've had people that had sexual addiction that will say to me, I hadn't been on that phone doing that for a long time now. Amen. That's great. How'd it happen? Well, I don't know. I don't have that desire anymore. I'm just enjoying Jesus. That's it. I'm in love with Jesus. He's loving on me. That's it. 
It's His presence. I'm telling you, I sensed His power on that. I was being tempted and His power came. Yeah, that's Jesus. That's the Jesus factor. That's what happens. Listen to this. Psalm 23, 6. Surely are only goodness and mercy and unfailing love. Does this sound like what we're talking about? Surely only goodness, mercy, and unfailing love shall follow me all the days of my life and through the length of my days, the house of the Lord. Now, not just a physical house. It's talking about His presence. I'll enjoy His presence as my dwelling place. And that's what we covered in Psalm 91.1. Yeah. We're to practice His presence. We're to camp out there in His presence. Divine protection. Our shield. Our shelter. Our castle. Our fortress. He'll be that. He'll be that. That's what He does. Goodness and unfailing love will follow you. His mercy will follow you. We get the best of both ends. We get grace, which is His unmerited favor. We get the goodness we don't deserve. That's grace. That's Jesus. We get mercy. We don't get the bad that we do deserve. That's mercy. That's grace. That's Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Well, that's what His love described that. Now listen to this. This ought to be pretty clear. John 10, 4. When He brought, when he had brought His own sheep outside, Jesus is giving a description of what it's like to walk with Him. Bring the sheep on the outside. He walks on before them. He leads them. He doesn't drive them. If you feel like you're being manipulated or pushed or something, that's not Jesus. Jesus leads. The question is, will you follow? Amen. He walks on before them and the sheep follow Him because they know His voice. His voice is calling you. You may feel like you've been away from the Lord for a while. He's still present. He never left you. You say, well, I don't sense Him. I don't see Him. I don't feel Him. Well, it's a lie because He's there. Yeah. Now, I want to tell you what. He's calling you. He's calling you. Are you listening? Yeah. Have you heard? Will you follow? Because He's calling you. Because He wants you. And so, this describes how the shepherd goes before the sheep and sheep follow Him. Now, in this simple picture, I saw a Jesus parade in my vision. I saw a Jesus parade. Yeah. Now, I like parades, but I want to tell you something. In a parade, there's always a first of the parade and following, and then there's an end of the parade. Yeah. And so I want to tell you what I saw in the Jesus parade. It goes real simple like this. Uh, when you are following the Good Shepherd, when you're following the Good Shepherd, His goodness and mercy and all the blessings you need in life will follow after you because you're in the Jesus parade. And so it's Jesus first. You know, that's a very important point. Yeah, that's Jesus right. first. Amen. Jesus is first, mm -hmm. then it needs to be you following right after the shepherd. Keeping your focus on the shepherd. Following the shepherd. Walking after the shepherd. And as you're walking after the shepherd, guess what? Goodness unmer and mercy, unfailing love is following you. Amen. It's following you. Amen. Yeah. And so that's the Jesus parade. Now, the problem is, is that some sheep are taught that they have to pursue blessing. Or they have to be good enough to get the blessing. And so they get off track. They get over here practicing a, a bunch of exercises and rules and regulations in order to be good enough to get the blessing. But I want to tell you, you get out of the parade that way. As a matter of fact, you mess up the parade in your own life if you turn around and start trying to chase the blessing down instead of following the shepherd. That causes a little confusion in the parade. Anybody in some confusion? Anybody ever been turned around like that? Yeah. Then I want to tell you, it's a simple cure. Repent means to change your mind. I'm going to pursue Him. I'm going to follow the great shepherd. And as you follow the great shepherd, guess what? The parade's in divine order. And the blessings, the goodness, and the mercy, and the unfailing love of the Lord is following you. You see the parade? Yeah. That's God's design. That's the way He loves it. That's what He likes to do. That's the Jesus parade. So don't pursue the blessings. Pursue Jesus, the blesser. Yeah. As you pursue Him or follow after Him, you don't have to be concerned about the blessing because the blessing is going to chase you down. They're on the way. Yeah. The blessings are on the way because you're following the shepherd. They know where you are. They got your address and they're following you. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom. Yeah. 
and his righteousness. Yes. Yeah. Amen. And so I, I'm telling you, it's this right here. It's not your righteousness. It's not your goody goody two shoes. It's not your report card. You've heard me say that. I want to tell you, seek ye first the kingdom. I, I, the only time I've ever got to speak in a seminary, I spoke on something similar in this verse. And when I said, seek ye first the kingdom, and, and the, the guys, man, seminary folk, it was chapel, man, they seemed to enjoy it. But after chapel, they would always have a QA. Mm -hmm. And so some of the people were asking questions, and, you know, they were a lot smarter in the Bible than I was. But I was trying to answer and just talk about relationship with the Lord because it's possible to study facts and miss Him. Yeah. Education over revelation. So that's what I was speaking about. And so I said this is just important to seek ye first the kingdom. Well, one of the professors uh, raised his hand and stood up and he said, well, what does it mean to seek ye first the kingdom? That's a mystery. And I said, well, not really. I, I wasn't trying to be disrespectful. I'm just real simple. I said, not really. And when I said that, everything got real quiet. I said, the way you seek the kingdom is to seek the king. You follow the king, he leads you into all that the kingdom has. Amen. And then, you practice his righteousness, not your righteousness, but you get to know his righteousness is in you. And then, all these things will chase you down. Well, when I said that, I guess the way I answered it was so simple that people started laughing and it embarrassed this professor. And he gave me a little trouble afterward. But I, I didn't mean any harm by it. I just say, let's keep it simple, saints. Amen. Then I want to tell you, this is God's way, God's design. All these things will be given unto you. And what are all these things? Well, he just got through talking about context and scheme. He just got through talking about the needs in your daily life. Amen. You don't have to focus on those. You focus on Him. Yeah. And those blessings, whatever you need in this life, will chase you down because He's paid for it. Now, the Hebrew translation in, in uh, Psalm 23, 6 about these blessings is goodness, mercy, and unfailing love will, will follow you. That The Hebrew translation of that is a lot stronger. Anybody talk about that? It's a stronger word. And it means to hunt. Wow, I like that. That speaks to me. Because that's where I'm from. <clears throat> that the goodness, unfailing love, mercy of God will hunt you down. And you're following after him. And I want to tell you, Jesus makes it easy. It requires submission and surrender in your own heart. But that's our part. His part is for the hounds, the beagles of heaven, to hunt you down with goodness, mercy, and unfailing love. Now that speaks to me because my dad raised beagles. And in East Texas, they practice hunting rabbits with beagles. And you didn't want your beagles to jump a cottontail. A little cottontail would just run a little bit and stop, run, run and hide, run and hide, run and hide from bush to bush. You wanted your dogs to get a swamp rabbit is what they call them. Swamp rabbits were big. I mean, I can remember holding them and their ears hitting the ground. I mean, that's how long they are. And a, a swamp rabbit is a great run for a beagle, a great hunt, because they'll run in a big circle like a deer does. They'll run a big circle. And so I can remember being there with the old timers and they'd have two or three packs of dogs. The dogs would turn loose, they'd jump a rabbit. I could hear the old timers because they'd have a little fire out there after it got started and say, well, yeah, yeah, that's Potvicker right there. That's him. Oh yeah, he must be leading right there. Oh, that's a little lady. Listen to her. Man, she's fast. She'll be giving that rabbit to business. And, and so, you know, they had to they'd, they'd talk about it and then they'd split up and then spread out. And the beagles would chase that rabbit, and the rabbit would be about a minute and a half, two minutes in front of the dogs. And so the rabbit would come around, and somebody would uh, take the rabbit out, and the beagles would come to be a great celebration. Then you'd get another hunt going. Now let me tell you about the beagles. They don't make good pets. Because they're field dogs. They're hunting dogs. Now some people have them as pets, but I won't take them. You want them toy dogs, okay. Uh, a beagle's a hunting dog. And he's going to want to be outside. He's going to want to chase something. He want to go hunt. And so it's hard for him to be cramped up in a little place. But I want to tell you about these beagles, man. There'd be a pack of them. And I can remember as a little fella and even growing up being an adult going rabbit hunting. But uh, what would happen is these beagles, they're like marathon runners. Their heart is about as big as their chest. And I want to tell you what they run. They're bred for it. It's in them. It's what they love to do. They'll do that and not eat. They'll do that and not sleep. 
they'll do it until they can't go anymore. Yeah. And they'll keep going. I can remember times that it'd be an all-day hunt. It'd get dark. We couldn't get the vehicles in. No matter if you call them. They won't come in. You'd have to go grab them and put your hands on them and drag them to the truck. But I want to tell you, I can remember many a time my dad said, well, we'll catch them in the morning. And we'd leave. They'd still be running. Get back in the morning. And sometimes my dad would lay his, uh, a jacket or some gloves down on the side of the trail there. And sometimes if they were wore out, they'd be laying there on them gloves and he'd come back and get them for the next morning. But I want to tell you what I remember every time. Listen to me. The last part of their tails would be bloody from that tail working in the brush. Their ears would be torn up and bloody from going through the brush. But they wouldn't stop. They were marathon runners. And when I saw this, that it means to hunt, I thought about the brothers of heaven that are chasing you down. Won't stop. Won't quit. Chasing you down. Hunting you down to bless you with the Father's love. So I want to tell you, that's God's heart for you. That's what God wants for you. And, and I'm out of time. I need to stop. But let me just uh, say it like this. His love for you never stops. Amen. You may have gotten out of order. You may have gotten out of line. You may have gotten completely out of the parade. You may be ending up in a rest stop that ends up more like a pit. But I want to tell you something. The parade is still on for you. Amen. All you got to do is repent in your heart. And I want to tell you, He is the one that positions you because of the cross in the secret place, Amen. in the dwelling place, in the shelter, and in the fortress. And I want to tell you, as you just follow the shepherd, the blessings are chasing you down. That's Him. That's His promise. That's what He wants to do. That's what He loves to do. You may have quit in the parade, but the parade hadn't quit on you. Alright, I want you to do this. Why don't you stand if you can. Let me uh, do a little confession of a couple things. We'll just let this be our confession today. And um, let, let me just say it like this. And you just, this morning, repeat after me. It is written, it is written I am loved by Jesus. I am loved by Jesus. I believe, I, believe I, am loved by the Father. I am loved by the Father. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. That I'm deeply loved. I'm highly favored, and I'm, highly and I'm greatly blessed. And I'm greatly blessed. I, believe I believe that I'm His favorite. His favorite. Now I want to say, this is your birthright. When you say that, you bless Him. Because I want to tell you, you're agreeing with His heart for you. I'm going to send you home with an assignment. I, I try not to use that word with teenagers. Let me just say it as a exercise spiritual exercise to savor his faith. Savor his faith. Practice being still long enough to let the Lord love him. And then you agree with it. You say it. Recognize it. Receive it. Respond to it. Okay? Because you are loved and you are highly favored. And when you believe it, you receive it. That's his heart for you. I'm praying for you right now. Father, thank you. We bless you. We praise you. Thank you for the love of Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can receive your love freely. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were rejected so that we would never be rejected. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you suffered for our healing and our restoration. Thank you, Lord, that your desire is for us to experience your love your divine love and your shalom peace. That peace that causes us to be made well, to be made whole. So I just speak in Jesus' name, manifestation of your Holy Spirit on the hearts and lives of your people that we might simply know deep down in our knower and be confident that we are loved and that we are accepted and that we are beloved because we know the beloved. And I just give you praise, Lord, for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's give the Lord a hand. Praise the Lord.